Well, being a uh, former teacher, I can tell that this time in the afternoon, I can tell the eyes are being glazed, uh, the tiredness is beginning to set in. So I thought maybe just to kind of wake you up a little bit, rather than have you say do calisthenics, uh, I would tell just an amusing story. It's a true story, but a, kind of an amusing story. So maybe you can try and picture yourself, and it's about me, uh, but what, I, what the scene is. When I was in college, we had a, a class, uh, several classes, <clears throat> um, logic. I don't think they teach that anymore, obviously. <clears throat> but it was logic class, and it was, of course, li- course heavily based in uh, philosophy, you know, we did syllogisms, we did all this, uh, but it was logic. And the professor, the instructor was, uh, he was a, well, at that time he was pretty ancient, um, but he was a very good man, a very good teacher, but he had a physical anomaly about him. And that's not like I'm being uncharitable or anything like that, because he would, as we got to know him, he would be very self-deprecating and talk about it, and it was kind of a, you know, a, a joke in a sense for him even, even though it was a physical anomaly for him. But his anomaly was that <clears throat> his eyes, when he would stand straight, his right eye would be pointed way over here, and then also his left eye would be pointed way over here. So even though he's standing straight, you know, he'd be looking, seems like he'd be looking this way and that way. So it was a little, you know, off-putting at first when you saw it. But I remember in class <clears throat> is that we were sitting in class. It was about the second or third week of, of class. And <clears throat> his normal routine was that we'd go over the material, we'd study the material, and then he'd ask questions of us. And he would also ask the question, then he would ask one of us by name to answer that question. <clears throat> so myself and a couple of my teammates, I was a baseball player, and so we would, it was 8 o'clock in the morning class, so you can imagine it was usually sparsely populated. But we were sitting way on the, on the left side of the class, or this side of the class, <clears throat> and then there was, there was three of us, and there was about a good 10 or so on the other side of the class. And he was in his middle, in the middle with his desk and his podium. <clears throat> and then he asked the que- this question on the material we were covering. But he didn't, then after the question, he didn't say who, you know, who to answer. So you can imagine in class, the tennis match began. <laughs> we're over there kind of looking over to the other side. Are you, is he talking to you? Is he talking to me? Who is he talking to? <laughs> and they're doing the same to us. <clears throat> and so he again, after everybody just was silent, <laughs> he asked the question again. But this time, he didn't really wait. He began to move out from behind his podium. And we're thinking, I was anywhere, and we all were, oh, good, he's going to move somewhere until we can have to figure out where he's asking. But instead, he moved out just right in front of his podium. <clears throat> and he asked the question again. And this time, you know, as good students that we were, we're beginning to kind of sweat because <laughs> we wanted to do well. We wanted that. <clears throat> so finally, he asked the question again, and then he moved over to on my side of the room. And at that point, it was an audible on that side of the room. Oh, whew. <laughs> <laughs> and so they're off the hook, but we're not. <laughs> So he asked the question again, but he still didn't tell. And then he moves right in front of our desk, and we're seated right next to each other. And he moves right to the middle. And remember, his eyes... (laughs) And I'm sitting in the middle. (laughs) (laughs) And then he asked the question again, and then, of course, now the tennis match becomes quite rapid. It's like, you you do it, you do it. I don't know, what's it? You do it. And finally, my, my first baseman, who's right next to me, decides, I'm going to do it. So he begins to say, well, professor, the answer to this, and he says, no, no, I didn't ask you. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, <"Whew." laughs> So now it's down to two, myself and, and my third baseman. And he asks the question again. And now, you know, now we're just sweating bullets. And now it's just like, well, let's toy, you know, coin toss time. So then my third baseman decides, I'm going to answer. So he begins. 
professor, you know, and he goes, no, 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 <laughs> I didn't ask you. <laughs> and he goes, the third baseman goes to me, he goes, good luck. <laughs> so I decided, okay, well, well now, whew, now I know what's going on. So I begin to say, okay, professor, this, and then I stopped. I didn't know the answer. <laughs> So I kind of hemmed and hawed and, you know, well, Professor, you know, this and, and this and that and that. And he, and he stopped He stopped me. He says, Mr. Oswald, and this is why I told the story, by the way. <laughs> he said, Mr. Oswald, in this class and in life in general, something is or it isn't. There is a right answer or a wrong answer. Know your answer and don't try to make things up because you will look like a fool, and you will be wrong. That was quite poignant of what he said, and that stuck with me. But basically what he was saying is that it's the basic philosophical tenet of non-contradiction. Something can't be two things at the same time. It is or it isn't. And so I'm sure the, one of the questions that we have especially today, <clears throat> is why are so many people in the Novus Ordo not converting then to the true Catholic faith? Why are so many people not leaving? But even, even more really disturbing, or more poignant really for us, why are some who were a set of contests going back to the Novus Ordo even with the flagrant, in-your-face apostate that, we ha that they have now of Bergoglio, Francis. And I think fundamentally the, the, the uh, I can't say it's the full answer, but I think fundamentally there's a, a good reason for why that's happening. Because those people, and again, at first I was one of them as well, they have not looked at and fully answered, without doubt, one crucial and fundamental question. And it's something that we all have to answer. <clears throat> and it's this. Is the Vatican II religion the Catholic religion? Or not? You have to fundamentally answer that question. It either is or it isn't. There is no in-between. There is no resisting the church. There is no correcting the church. Now, if Vatican II say, is the Catholic Church, and of course we know it's not, but let's just say it is the Catholic Church. You must submit totally to it, to its authority in which it teaches, in its doctrine, dogmas, morals, disciplines, universal order, magisterium, all of it. You can't hold or teach to the old ways, as they say, that have been officially disregarded and changed substantially. So basically you must then, and I'm not really speaking really out of context here, but you must then pick up your balloons in the back, join the liturgical dancers, you must hold hands with everyone, and enjoy then man as God. Now, if the Vatican II religion, church, is not the Catholic religion and faith, and it's not, and it has been proven beyond any doubt because the church, of course, is recognizable. God gave us everything we need to see the truth. Then you can have nothing to do with it. Nothing. You must reject it completely and flee from it. You must flee from those who claim that they are authority as they are nothing but wolves. 
and they're not of Christ's. This is the fundamental question we have to answer. This is the crux of the matter. And again, this is not um, a game. This is not about personal preferences or claiming ignorance or confusion. You must see, you must look at that, you must answer that question because one's salvation depends on it. Now, of course, you know this. But as always, we must revisit it at times to know why you are here. So what is the source of the problem? Because we can look at the band-aids of it or the superficial parts of it, but there's a source to it. There's a source to everything. There's a source to the problem. And the source of it is Vatican II itself. The documents of Vatican II itself, the changes that came from that, all the subsequent changes, of course, in that quote-unquote spirit. It was not just presenting the Catholic faith in different light or uh, not just, uh, um, you know, maybe changing some of the things that could be changed. No, it was a substantial change was had into something else. And the heresies of Vatican II are easily seen. And much ink, of course, have been, has been written on it. Uh, much great articles, uh, like uh, CMRI, of course, Bishop Brunus have put out many, uh, Bishop Sanborn, Father Jakada, all these. And priests, even from, of course, from the very beginning, have written and put out these things. But not of their own, I think, or my opinion, but using the, actually the church herself given to us by God to say, this is what it looks like. This is what it is. If it's not this, it's not the Catholic Church. But take, out of all those heresies of Vatican II, of course, and you all, of course, we all should know what it is. But let's just take one that had really, in my opinion, sort of the most impact, at least uh, direct impact, on the person in the pew. And I think that one is ecumenism. So what is ecumenism? Basically, in a nutshell, ecumenism says, for Vatican II, that other religions are ways and means of salvation. It's not really just the Catholic faith. Now, for them. Now, they'll say, now they'll often will say, and I've heard it many, many times in seminary and and et cetera when I was in Vatican II, they'll still say that, oh, the Catholic faith is, yes, the one true faith, because they can't deny outwardly that dogma. But they'll say it's the best. It's like flying on an airplane, right? There's different classes. And they'll say Vatican II, or uh, um, they'll say that the Catholic faith, the Catholic Church, is is like is first class. It has everything, right? But ecumenism says, but others can get you to heaven as well, even though they may be second class or third class. You know, they have they have partial truth in them. They have par- or in partial communion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But they're all on the same plane, go on the same place. That's ecumenism. That's what's being taught. That is a direct heresy. And the modernists have purposefully, by this, destroyed any sense of Catholic identity, which makes then our Lord, blasphemy, a liar. Because our Lord says what? One faith, one baptism, one church. They have purposely made something that our Lord made and the church has continued, which was black and white, to be now gray. In, in the Nova Soto Seminary, one of the catchwords that we had that was often told to us in our theological classes was we were constantly taught what we said, we used to say both and. You know, there'd be some theological points, and often, you know, there'd be this point or that point, and the instructor, you know, the 
priest, quote unquote, would say, yes, both, it's both those, and it's something else as well. So basically what he's saying is, you can believe anything. It's all gray. And I think ecumenism then has made Catholics, or who were once Catholics at one point, no longer to have one of those fundamental attributes of being a Catholic and, and of loving God. And that is, there is no hatred of heresy anymore. The only time the word heresy is used, really, in Vatican II is for you. <laughs> Me, of course, yes. But why? Why is there no more heresy to them? Again, ecumenism, because all these other religions, they're, they're, there's good in them as well. Right? That's what they say. Vatican II itself teaches it, that we're all brothers. We're all people of God, right? Some may keep to, you know, what the church has always taught and say, wait a minute, no, that's not right. And, that, and they're correct in that, but, and this is what I was. I actually, because I held to the old faith, right, the faith, the true faith, said, wait a minute, no, that's wrong. But I was still in Vatican II. I was being disobedient to the Vatican II church if I had said that that was the Catholic Church. And there are so many who are in Vatican II now who do that as well. Now they may think, yeah, that's, we hold that. We, I'm, I used to teach from the Baltimore Catechism. I used to, um, but I was actually being disobedient. Because if I was saying that that's the Catholic Church, I have to submit to it all. So I have to submit then to ecumenism. I can't reject it because that's taught. That's a doctrine of their religion. Father Frederick, Frederick Faber, a very prolific writer, priest, wrote in the 1800s. A lot of great books that he wrote. <clears throat> and one of them was a book called The Precious Blood. I would suggest getting a hold of that. And I'll just quote from parts of his book here, just a few quotes, just to give you a flavor of that. And Father Faber wrote this. He says, the old-fashioned, and the language he uses, even in the 1800s, I mean, it's applicable today. He says, the old-fashioned hatred of heresy is becoming scarce. God is not habitually looked at as the sole truth. And so the existence of heresies no longer appalls the mind. He continues, he says, it, it requires courage, both moral and mental, to believe the whole of a grand nation to be wrong or to think that an entire century can go astray. How often have you heard today people say as one of their things, how could this happen? When they say, how could it happen, for them then it means, well, therefore it can't happen. But it has. But we've been warned, of course, about it. And then Father Faber continues. He says, then again, the crowning disloyalty to God is heresy. It is the sin of sins, the very loathsome of things which God looks down upon in this malignant world. It is the polluting of God's truth, which is the worst of all impurities. Yet how light we make of it. We look at it and are calm. We touch it and do not shudder. We mix with it and have no fear. We see it touch holy things and have no sense of sacrilege. We breathe its odor and show no signs of detestation or disgust. Again, he's writing in the 1800s. So the Vatican II religion and all its adherents, irregardless of their, they may be of, some may be of goodwill, but that's not our point to say. We can't say to someone, well, they're of goodwill. We don't know. 
We go by what is objective, what is, what is done and what is said. So the Vatican II religion and all its adherents, whether they are, say, of the progressives, I heard Father talk about the progressives in, as well, or the conservatives, or the resistors, the recognizing resistors, they all are imbued and all practice that grayness of ecumenism, of things being fluid, and to ultimately then choose oneself what they think is right. And again, this is harsh things to say, but it's reality. So what it comes down to, in a, in a certain sense then, is whether or not we're going to choose one of two things. <clears throat> Either God's promises or man's wishes. God's promises, of course, equals what? Equals the truth. Unchanging truth. Never contradicted. God can never give error. It can never be unambiguous. It is always clear. There's no grayness to God's promises. Don't you think... And again, this is something for us to, to keep in mind, is don't you think that Almighty God, who loves us so much, would have made something as your salvation, which is the most important thing to him, should be to us, clear? To give you everything you need. So, God's promises is his Truth is God's will. It's his law. It is there for us because God, of course, has, he wants all to go to heaven. It's his universal salvific will. And the church, of course, Catholic church and all in it abide by God's promise of his way, of his will, conforming then ourselves to him. Now, compare that again to Vatican II's new religion. It puts man's wishes over God's promises. In other words, God must conform to man now. The church must conform to society now, to mod the modern world. It's solely based on emotionalism and naturalism. And again, I heard Father's emotionalism. It is always one of, you know, inclusion, never of exclusion anymore for them. I don't know how many times that in seminary and in parishes in Vatican II, you probably heard this before, they'd always say something like, and they'd use the hand gestures, I, even though I'm holding the microphone, they would always say, we must, uh, we must build bridges, not walls. <laughs> they use the hand gestures, right, to emphasize that. Or how many times have you heard this say, and again, like Vatican II, it was not binding. But really what they're saying, I wish Vatican II was not binding, so therefore it isn't. Or Vatican II was binding. I wish Vatican II was binding, and so therefore it is. Or you can read Vatican II in the light of tradition. Or even things like on a more practical level, say something, and I've heard this all the time in Vatican II, you know, God doesn't care what I wear as long as I come to church or be a good person, whatever that means. Or he's a good person, so everything then is all right. You know, this is Vatican II speak. 
What it means ultimately is to form the faith, your faith, your personal faith, how you want it. To either change or don't change, whatever you want. It is that funny little thing that Martin Luther uh, had brought about, you know, the priesthood of all believers. Everyone's a priest. Everyone's your own authority. That's how, let's take a look at how it would be practically, a practical ecumenism, and there, meaning that there's many ways for everything. Let's say you have two parishes. One, in this parish you have Father Bob. In this parish, then you have Father Jones. And let's just take a, a pertinent moral issue. In Father Bob's parish, he's all for homosexuality and, and, you know, inclusionism, you know, sodomy and all that. He's all for that. But in Father Jones's Paris, of course, he's against it, and he's actually trying to teach what the church has always taught. So what's the lay person, what do they do? It's the same subject, but they're totally opposite teaching that they're teaching. So basically, the lay person will say, I like Father Bob better, because I think that's right. And so I'll go there. Or I like Father Jones better. It's the laity who is the maker of their own truth. And it might correspond to the real truth or not. So basically in Vatican II, lay people are in charge. It's, it is the Protestant playbook. When I was in... Um, one summer when I was in seminary, I had to be a part of a program, a hospital program, they called it CPE. It was just a, a program that, uh, you know, a Catholic would get together, uh, would be forced to get together with all different sort of Protestants or other faiths, and you'd be in a hospital apparently to learn how to minister to people in the hospital. That was just a scam. It was just to get together so that you can be, you know, uh, ecumenistic. And so I remember talking to one of the Protestant seminarians who was there, and he was all worried because later that summer he had to go interview for his Protestant church to the lay board that was there so he can get hired as a minister there. And I asked him, I said, that, I mean, it's just like going to a job. And he says, well, yeah, you know, as long as I, I preach to them or teach them what they want, what they want to hear, you know, I'm okay. I'll, I'll be there then. But as soon as I don't, well, then they'll just fire me and they'll get somebody else. Novus Ordo. So you have that difference. And maybe like you have Father Jones, who's, you know, against that uh, sodomy and against trying to teach you know, teach uh, the right way of what the church says on that. But then you have someone, Bergoglio, Francis, blurts out to the whole world, who am I to judge, right? That's on morals. Or the directives, say, coming from the Holy See on, you know, we have to be, you have to be inclusive in your parish, you have to, you know, we have to look at them on with respect, etc., blah, blah, blah. So what is Father Jones to do? And I was this Father Jones too, by the way. You'd say, well, I don't have to listen to what the Pope says because he's wrong or the, they're wrong. Or Vatican II, you know, teachings, well, that's wrong. And in reality, it was. But both Father Jones and Father Bob still deny the Catholic faith. One's being disobedient to their, who they claim is the authority. One, of course, is denying it outright. So man's wish, though, kind of takes precedence then over God's promises. <clears throat> I like to use it this way, when people use man's wish and kind of do that, 
they're like hedging their bets kind of thing. And you've heard this too. And I'll, Again, when I was a, uh, in college, I had visited my cousin one time. My cousin, he liked to you know, go once in a while to the, uh, the horse races, right, the, the racetrack. And he'd like to bet, you know, nothing extravagant. I never had any money, so I didn't care. <laughs> I just went because it was fun to watch the horses go around, you know, that sort of thing. And so I don't really know much too much about betting or what have you, but he had placed, and I'm just using, just, uh, I can't remember the amounts per se, but I know the, 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 what was uh, the result of it. He had placed like $20 on a horse to win and then a, another $20 on a horse to, to place and another one on to show, whatever that meant. <clears throat> so basically he spent $60, right, 20 20 20 So he paid $60. Well, the one, his horse, one of them won or came in whatever is supposed to was to show. So out of that $20, actually he got $40 back. So he got paid $40. And he was all excited. I won, I won, I won. Great, it's so much, I'm you know, excited, I won, I won. And I looked at him and I says, wait a minute. I know my math here. You paid $60, but you won $40. You just lost $20. <laughs> no, I didn't, no, I didn't, no, I won, I won. He fooled himself into thinking that he won. That's man's wish. You fool yourself into thinking you're creating a false reality. But in Vatican II as well, you have, just like, you know, Father Jones and Father Bob, it's almost like a cult of personality. Find your favorite flavor. So you have a Mr. Raymond Burke, right? or a Mr. Athanasius Schneider, right? Very pomp, exterior things. They often will say Catholic things most of the time. Then you have it on the other side, you have someone like a Father Walter Casper or a uh, Father Ratzinger or Bergoglio, Mr. Bergoglio. Whole gamut, pick your own flavor. But they're all the same. They do the same thing. It's the same coin, just different sides. Because it, everyone is then still attached to the Novus Ordo in one way, shape, or form. Now, everyone in here, I'm sure, has family and friends who are in the Novus Ordo. All my family are. In fact, I even just found out recently that one of my younger nephews, not family, my family didn't tell me this, but I found out, that one of my younger nephews is actually going now to the college seminary in the Novus Ordo. My family didn't tell me because they would know the answer. And I'm not happy about that at all. And I let them know, but in a firm but kind way. And so I pray that he sees the truth before it's too late for him. We wish that, or many wish, that the Novus Ordo is somehow okay. Because of them, because we have so many who know or are there or went back there or what have you. And so people within the Novus Ordo, they go along with things. Because ultimately Vatican II Religion is easy because you get to pick and choose what you want or whatever flavor you want. You can kind of create your own reality. But if we don't do that, of course, which we have not, and we're rightfully so saying the truth that that's not the Catholic faith, of course now we get accused of condemning souls we get accused of being in the judgment seat in that regards, which isn't ours. That's our Lord. Our Lord is the one who's going to condemn. He's the one who knows the hearts and minds. But they'll often use, you're judging me. You're judging that. We fear saying the truth often because that if this is the right way, then there is a wrong way.
isn't it easier to wish? Which means that we can make all sorts of rationalizations and change things to make ourselves or others feel better? Isn't it easier to wish that? Like we don't have to listen to the Pope. Or this is a, this is a, this one made my, this made me scratch my head. I've heard this before. Well, he's only the Pope when he says something Catholic. (laughs) Or this is the big one now that's being pushed. Well, there's been uh, popes who've been heretics before. Or this one is even more prominent. As long as I have the Latin Mass, it's okay. It's not about that. Isn't it easier to wish those things and to kind of uh, go along rather than to obey God's promises, his laws? which means always, always the narrow path, the path of difficulty, the path of persecution. But it's the path of our Lord, the path of the Catholic Church. So we do not deny infallibility. We do not deny indefectibility of the Church. We are the only ones who uphold it. So often, you know, we hear... We try to tell ourselves, or at least in Vatican II, well, nothing has changed. We wish nothing had changed. We, pr- we replace man's wishes, though. Ultimately, another word can be used for man's wishes. Excuses. We begin to excuse this or that, make excuses for ourselves or for others or what have you. But Vatican II has substantially changed God's promises to become a new religion. It has thus, of course, left the Catholic Church. It is like Protestants. Think almost like um, the Episcopalians. Again, I was in in that CPE program in the summer in the hospital. One of them was an Episcopalian, and she was a very nice woman, of course, but yet we had discussions on that. And I asked her one time, because she was, you know, speaking, before I really knew she was an Episcopalian, she was speaking things that were, some things were Catholic. And I asked her, I said, are you Catholic? And she says, oh, yes. I said, oh, really? Where would you perish? Where'd you go? Oh, you know, whatever she said. And I said, oh, well, I'm Episcopalian. <laughs> so they'll say, Episcopalians often, not all, of course, they'll say, well, we're Catholic too. It's that three-branch theory, of course, which, which is condemned by the church. But think like Vatican II. That's what Vatican II does. They say they're Catholic. Vatican II does, the the council and all that, but it's not. It's chaos. It's choose what you want, do what you want. And I'll give you an example of how that sounds like. And imagine this. When I was in the Holy Land on pilgrimage in the seminary, we were, I forget, it was the Week of Unity, uh, not the Church Act of Unity, which we, of course, the Catholic Church always had. It was a week of unity, of you know, ecumenical unity. And there were, everyone of all faiths were going to go to uh, the upper room, believe it or not, and to have a joint ecumenical service in the upper room. And one of the things, and of course, I feigned, everyone was walking in there, and, you know, and I just, I knew this was just going to be a, Ugh. So I, you know, I pretended, oh, I don't feel so good. I don't feel so good. You know, I, I'm just going to stand out here and get some air while everyone else is piling in. And I mean, ever you had Protestants, you had, uh, you had, I don't think you had Jews, but you had, um, there was Hindus there, I think, even in Buddhist, there was all sorts of flavors, you name it. They were all kind of in there and how wonderful this is. And one of the things they wanted to do kind of to try and 
quote, prove their unity amongst each other. They all, and I heard this from outside, so whoever was leading it, the microphone. Now, brothers and sisters, let us all pray the Lord's Prayer, okay? But let's all pray the Lord's Prayer in our own languages at the same time. Now, these are people from all over the world. And so here they go. And it sounded like nails on a chalkboard, and it was just chaos, and they were all... That's the Novus Ordo. That's, if you could hear the Novus Ordo, that's what it would sound like. The Tower of Babel. There was a man who was on mission, or I was on mission, I say, and driving, and, and I was, uh, had to um, go to the store because I, was, uh, I started getting a little sick and I wanted to just quickly get some aspirin or something. And I walk into the store, and down south, uh, you know, it's uh, all mostly Protestant. I mean, there's some Catholics spread out. Um, but I have my, obviously, I always have my clerics on. I'm at the cash register, you know, the self-checkout, and I'm getting my little aspirin or whatever. And the man who worked there, um, who was an older man, he says, oh, hi, Father. And when you're in the south, when someone says, hi, Father, you're like, <laughs> what? Because <laughs> it's not often said. <laughs> but he says, oh, you know, I'm... You know, I'm Catholic. I says, oh, okay. And, uh, and he told me where he went. And I says, he went on and on in this. And I says, oh, you know, I, he asked me where I, my parish was. And I said, where I was. And I said, oh, you know, I, I do, you know, the Latin Mass only. And, and he says, oh, oh, yeah, I remember that. He's old enough to remember that. I mean, he was, he was in college, actually, when he was going to um, Loyola University, which is up in my neck of the woods where I was born in Chicago. And he told me, this is pre-Vatican II, this is in the early 60s, before, before Vatican II kind of started. He says, yeah, when we're in Loyola, you know, that, uh, you know, sort of the Mass was in Latin, of course, and, but, you know, there was a, down the street, there was a high Anglican parish that was there. And it was common that our priest would go there to say Mass for them, and that Anglican would come to his Catholic and say mass for them. And he said that, and he says, and he says, oh, we just, that was just great. We just thought that was great. And when he's telling me this, he probably saw my facial expression that I like bit a lemon. Because I was like, oh. <laughs> what do you say? At that point, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in a discussion in, in the store like that. But he says, well, you know, it's the same mass. Anyway, right? I mean, we, we you know, pretty much everyone thought that was great, and since we really believe kind of roughly the same things anyway, it was, just, it was great. Is the Vatican II religion a Catholic religion or not? That is the question you have to fundamentally ask. We know that our Lord, indeed, is the invisible head of the church, and as such, of course, we know that he rules in in her in an invisible manner, but only, of course, through the Holy Ghost, who proceeds from him and the Father, is sent by him. And the Holy Ghost, of course, continually assists the teaching church so that in matters of faith and morals, she cannot err. It is impossible for the Catholic Church to give error, period. We know, of course, this is a, a dangerous time, and, and one step in the wrong direction might prove fatal. But therefore, we know, though, we have the great consolation that the Holy Ghost is given to us by the ministry of the church herself, in order that his grace may be the guiding principles, which is traced in our souls by the finger of God, to stand out clear before our minds so that when these seductive whisperings come, of corrupt nature, they strive to draw us away from God with unerring certainty. We're shown the way to go. And many had done that. Some it took later. Me, it was later. Of course, I, didn't, I only knew Vatican II. 
Father Faber continues in his book, The, the Precious Blood. He says, we lack devotion to truth as truth, as God's truth. Our zeal for souls is puny because we have no zeal for God's glory. And he continues, he says, where there is no hatred of heresy, there is no holiness. A man might be an apostle, becomes a fester in the church for the want of this righteous abomination, this righteous hatred of heresy. And he says, and I think this is key too as well, we need St. Michael to put new hearts into us in these days of universal heresy. He's talking in the 1800s. So for those who may be getting a little uncomfortable maybe now about kind of this, um, kind of, you know, bending to that peer pressure of a false kindness, which is an indifference, ultimately. Pope St. Pius X, writing to one of his bishops, wrote this. He says, kindness is for fools. They want them, meaning he's talking they, meaning those who are lack of, of hatred for heresy, those who are um, you know, not uh, against modernists. They want them to be treated with oil, soap, and caresses, but they should be beaten with fists. In a duel, you don't count or measure the blows. You strike as you can. War is not made with charity. It is a struggle, a duel. If our Lord were not terrible, in a certain sense, he would not have given an example in this too. See how he treated the Philistines the sowers of error, the wolves in sheep's clothing, the traitors in the temple. He scourged them with whips. So we have to have that same conviction. We have to answer that question. It doesn't mean, of course, that we're looking at the people themselves, at least the ones in the pew. We have to hate them, of course, of course not. We have to understand that Vatican II is not the Catholic faith, and you have to have that without any doubt. And to end and conclude this, this talk as well, it's always good to have great encouragement. And Saint, or Pope Pius XII, he had wrote an encyclical in 1953 on commemorating the uh, anniversary on the canonization of St. Bernard of Clairvaux. He says this, we can think of no better way to conclude this encyclical letter than in the words of the doctor Melifluus, to invite all to be more and more devout to the loving mother of God, and in each in his respective state in life to strive to imitate her exalted virtues. If at the beginning of the 12th century grave dangers threatened the church and human society, the perils besetting our own age are hardly less formidable. The Catholic faith, supreme solace of mankind, often languishes in souls and in many regions and countries is even subjected to the bitterest public attacks. With the Christian religion, Catholic religion, either neglected or cruelly destroyed, morals both public and private clearly stray from the straight path and following the torturous path of error and miserable and vice. Charity, which is the bond of perfection, concord, and peace, is replaced by hatred, enmities, and discords. A certain restlessness, anxiety, and fear have invaded the minds of men. It is indeed to be greatly feared that if the light of the gospel gradually fades and wanes in the minds of many, or if, what is even worse, they utter, utterly reject it, the very foundations of civil and domestic society will collapse, and more evil times will unhappily result. Therefore, as the doctor of Clairvaux sought and obtained from the Virgin Mother Mary help for the troubles of his times, let us all through the same great devotion and prayer so strive to move our Divine Mother that she will obtain from God relief from these grave evils which are either already upon us or may yet befall and that she who is at once kind and most powerful will by the help of God Grant that the true, lasting, and fruitful peace of the church may at last dawn in all nations and peoples. That is the beauty and glory of our Catholic faith, unchanged, and has and will continue to the end of time to get 
the faithful through the darkest and the ugliest of times to save souls. And so it's good to behoove us. <coughs> Do you pray your rosary every day? When you pray your rosary every day, some of the intentions you pray for are, should be, for the truth, to persevere in the truth, for the conversion of all to the true Catholic faith, and for an end to the abomination of the Novus Ordo. Our Lady will make it happen if you want it to happen. As she says, pray, pray, pray for the conversion of sinners. <coughs> Amend your life. Be grateful and thankful that you have the faith. Never take it for granted. May God bless you and Mary keep you. <coughs>